Welcome to this talk about philosophy of macros in Scala. Uh, it's, it's a great pleasure for me to, to present here, a stranger <laughs> who might have known. So, uh, today we will first take a look at, at the history of macros in Scala, how we got macros, how it started, how it went through the release process, and how macros ended up in uh, Scala 2.10, and then we'll, we'll take, take a small look into the future. Uh, but all that, it, it, it's not just, just for being cute, but uh, uh, for the purpose, purpose of distilling the essence of macros in Scala. So sure, macros, macros in Scala are very heavily inspired by other languages. Lisp, for instance, right? Uh, but, they have, uh, but they have some unique things that I would like to, to share today. And uh, well, that's, that's the, main, the main point of the presentation. So, First of all, how, how did Scala get macros? Uh, back then, when I, when I was uh, still in Belarus, my home country, uh, I was an enterprise C-sharp developer, and I was very excited when C-sharp 3.0 came out. You know, expression trees, metaprogramming in, in, some, in some way, that was, that was revelation, right? And I, I, since then, I've been doing some uh, metaprogramming projects for C-sharp. For instance, cross-compiler of LinQ queries to JavaScript and back. And then I did uh, cross-compilation of C-sharp to CUDA. But, you know, it was always handwritten and not so elegant because there's no language support. And then cross-compilation for CUDA, it was, it was really funny because I actually had to, to write a bytecode decompiler and roll my own ASTs and stuff. Well, yeah, that felt good. And uh, roughly, roughly at that time period, I realized that in Scala, people actually can do similar stuff. But it's, it's much simpler because they can change the language. And then I thought, OK, cool. Um, it, it would be really great to, to join this cool team. And that's how I ended up in, uh, at the PFL, uh, the home of Scala, the place where, where it was conceived. And uh, well, I started there as a, as a PhD student. And all PhD students at the PFL, they have to do semester projects. And so my, my semester project started uh, two years ago in September. Actually, two days ago, it was second anniversary. And well, I just wrote to, to the mailing list, all right, let's, let's do macros. Well, so first, of, uh, at first, at first, it was just a fun project. And uh, it was heavily inspired by Nemerle, maybe you know this language, uh, .NET language that has macros. Uh, but then, but then it, it rapidly escalated because macros suddenly became necessary for, for an industrial project. And that was a very interesting transition. So uh, what, what project I'm, I'm talking about? Well, actually, there's this thing called Slick, a joint uh, product of EPFL and TypeSafe. And Slick is, is basically a database connectivity kit for, for Scala applications. So the idea was to, to have queries integrated into the language so that people could, uh, could do stuff like this. So you, you write queries in normal Scala without any DSLs and stuff, and then these queries get uh, transparently translated to well, some data structures, the main specific data structures. Well, it's all very cool, and uh, LinQ did that by, by these expression trees, by type-directed lifting of, of code. And, uh, well, yeah, this, this, this is how folks uh, were going to do that. And then I realized macros, I mean, really macros, people, macros. And, and then, sort of, I went through everything that I knew about macros from Nemeral, from template Haskell, from, from Scheme Racket. And then I came to Martin, Martin Andersky, uh, my professor and also creator of Scala, with, with, this, with something like this. So I told Martin, look, there's such thing as macros, and they can implement link. And with macros, you can essentially write methods that are executed at compile time, and these methods can generate code. And then this code, well, can be used as usual, as if the programmer has, uh, has written this code or her, herself. And uh, well, it was, it was kind of cool when I did this presentation at the lab meeting. People were more or less excited. And uh, then I started explaining all this stuff that macros do compile time function execution. Well, essentially, you write normal Scala functions, and they get executed at compile time by, by the compiler itself. And then, uh, well, macros, you can write quasi quotes, so this is the, these things in, fa in fancy brackets, these are quasi quotes, static code templates that you can uh, insert things into, dynamic things into using dollars. 
So it's just just a lot very similar to, to, to template languages or to bash even. And then these quasi calls, these quasi calls are hygienic because look here we crea create queries and queryables and stuff, but this code is actually is not going to be executed here. Macros are going to expand somewhere else. So s someone calls calls filter. Oh, by, by the way, here, here's the convention that I'm going to follow in the presentation. So everything macro related is going to be in blue. So this, this filter call is actually a macro. So wh when someone calls this filter, the function gets executed, this macro def, and then the result gets inserted at the call side. So everything that, that, that we see here, creation of queryable, filter, and the, all these uh, fancy ST nodes, it's all going to move from, from the definition of the macro to the invocation. Okay. So here's, here's where we uh, meet hygiene. So in, in, this, in, in this code, implicit is the understanding of the programmer, of the macro programmer, that if, if, you're, uh, if you, say, import some identifier here, for example, query or filter, then it's going to mean the same when it gets into the call side of the macro. So you write, you write stuff here, it ends up here, and it means exactly the same. So more or less, th this is the idea of hygiene. And, uh, well, since we can have macro devs, how about we, we have macro classes? How about generating classes with macros? How about having macro packages and stuff, you know? All these fancy things. And as, as I was elaborating through, through my presentation the, on this lab meeting, uh, I, I saw Martin having this expression, oh yeah, mm, really interesting. Yeah, yeah. And I, I, I couldn't understand that because look, I'm, I'm talking about this fancy stuff, it's so exciting, look, quasi codes, hygiene, oh my God, and all that in Scala. But some, something was clearly wrong. And uh, well, now in hindsight, that's quite obvious, but, but well, look. <laughs> so I, I just wanted to introduce a single language feature and it brings a lot of friends. And <laughs> well, Scala, by, by that time, Scala was almost 10 years old. It, has quite a number of features, and, and therefore we, we really had to stay minimalistic. And later on I realized that, and Martin told me that explicitly, and we had like fierce fights about that. I, I wanted to sneak some features into the language, and he pushed back, and it, it was really one of the best experiences that I had. It, 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 it's, it's very empowering. So for, for you guys, though, those who come from uh, Lisp, or those who, uh, who wrote your own macro-enabled languages, like Nimrod, uh, which was presented yesterday at ELC, it might, be, uh, it might come as a surprise, because macros are, are typically treated as a core feature of the language, something that all other features have uh, to look up to and to, to yeah, okay. But, but, but here, here, it's, here it's a bit different. Here macros have to stay minimalistic. And uh, this is an important peculiar point uh, that empowered us to, to do some cool stuff, really cool stuff. And I'm going to share that in just 10 minutes. So yeah, th this, this is just a quote from one of the discussions that we had at the mailing list from, from Martin Andersky, that it has to be, absolutely has to be simple in order to get into Scala. So what's, uh, what was the result of our discussions and uh, what, uh, what we put into 2.10? Just a single language feature unhygienic macros uh, that can only expand uh, macro applications. Well, of course, for, again, for those of you who come from Lisp background, this might so sound a bit meh. Well, what, what he's talking about, come on. In Lisp enclosure, macros can do everything, so, well, Scala is sort of, well, it's, it's not like that. It's not like that. And, uh, Oh yeah, all, all, all those fancy things that I was talking about, quasi-coding, hygiene, we, we managed to, to work them around. And uh, this particular workaround uh, that we put in place to, to achieve hygiene and quasi-coding, it's, it's kind of interesting. So uh, I, I'm going to show how it works. So he, here's actual Scala code executable into 10 that you can write. So you write macros as you would write normal functions. So well, in Scala you define functions with def, then put some type signatures. But on the right-hand side, where usually a function body goes, you just write macro something. And this something is actually a reference to, to a function that's going to be executed at compile time. So this function takes abstract syntax trees and stuff, well, some representation of the program, then it generates some more code. 
And uh, here's, here's this thing that I was talking about, about quasi-coding and hygiene. So usually macro-enabled languages, they, they have a separate facility for quasi-codes. As we've seen in the previous example, those fancy brackets that create code templates. Uh, but here, this, this role is taken by, by reify. So reify is a function, well actually it's, it's another macro. Well, that's, that essentially takes a code template, it generates a corresponding abstract syntax tree, it also allow, allows to, to insert dynamic parts into this template uh, by, by calls to this magic function splice, stuff like that. And well, as, as, as you can see even here, uh, this minimalism, it, uh, it had some, some merits. So essentially, since Martin wasn't very impressed by quasi-coding, uh, we, we had to think a bit more and uh, to come up with, uh, with this elegant facility that uses macros themselves to create a quasi-coding uh, quasi tool. So at their core, macros in 210, they're unhygienic, but they can sort of bootstrap themselves into being hygienic using this, uh, using this Rayify macro. And well, that was quite interesting, and by, by that time, uh, it was almost code freeze for, for Scala 210, and so we sort of started looking into the future with high hopes, and this is another quote from, from Martin. That's, uh, for, for quite a long time, he, he was skeptical of macros because of all, of all the baggage that they bring. But this scheme, it's, uh, well, it won his heart. So, what, what happened then after we released macros in, in Scala 2.10? How did people like it? Well, actually, even though, even though there were some problems that we're currently fixing and we're planning fixes for future versions, and uh, the, uh, all in all, it was much, much more popular than we could even imagine. A lot of innovation in Scala today is, is driven by macros. And actually, all talks about Scala at this conference, they're powered by macros to, to, to some extent. So for instance, the async talk that, that some of you have seen today, it, it's based on async and await macros. And the uh, talk about pickles and spores that's going to, to happen in, the, in this very room, right after mine, it's also based on macros. So that's, that was really unexpected because it's, it's just a small language feature, not very powerful, just expands macro application, uh, method applications, and yet it has, it has this interesting effect. So what's, what's the deal? Oh yeah, right. <laughs> I sort of glossed over that, but I think it's worth mentioning. So Scala 2.10 got released in, in January this year, and in April we, we had an internal meeting where we decided to, it, it was released in an experimental capacity. And during this meeting we decided, okay, macros are so useful that we gotta put them in, in the language. So we decided to, to figure out some, some subset of macros, some non-experimental thing that we can rely on. I'll talk about that later. And put it into the, some of the future versions of the language. So what's the reason for, for that? Why did macros work? And uh, our hypothesis is that essentially f for macro users it, does, it doesn't make much difference uh, whether they use normal methods or, or macros. They just don't notice that. And by a lucky coincidence, a lot of features in Scala, really a lot of features, they get desugared to method calls. And this is where macros can hijack and can literally empower these features to do something, something completely new. So as you see, here are, uh, here's a big list of things that are implemented with method calls. I, I think uh, this is quite a cute feature of Scala. And pr probably this list is incomplete. It's intentionally incomplete. Uh, but all, all, that, all that can benefit from compile time powers that are brought by macros. So our experience was, uh, to some extent, documented in f first in a, in a workshop paper, let our powers combine, and uh, also in my talk uh, in Tel Aviv in, in July. So you're, you're welcome to take a look for, for more details. There are a lot of examples there, how, how macros changed this or that language feature and how, how that interplay allowed people to solve problems that were unreachable, unreachable before. And here, uh, I'll, just, I'll just give a, a couple couple of the most impressive examples. So first of all, speaking of uh, async, uh, and speaking of this, how macros feel like normal methods. 
So this is an example of uh, how, uh, how one would do asynchronous programming in, in Scala in functional style. So you have futures, and then you have these methods, flat map and map, that, that are sort of combinators that work on futures, and they, they allow these futures to compose. So you do this flat map, map, you, you extract uh, results of futures into temporary variables, essentially, when you write disclosures, uh, which are parameters to flat map, and everything's cool. But well, as, as, you, as you might agree, th this, is, this is quite inscrutable. And imagine what if this grows 10 times, for example. So with macros, we can, uh, we can sort of turn this around. And we can just use async as a macro that will orchestrate this transformation of synchronous code to a synchronous one. And with a weight, we can mark the asynchronity that we want to bring in the, into the code. But the best thing that for the user, it doesn't feel like, like a compiler extension, which, is, which it is. And it doesn't feel like a new language feature, so we didn't, actually have, have, we didn't actually have to put this into the compiler. How Philip said, we, we, we don't have to implement this as, a, as another phase in the compiler pipeline. This is just a macro, this is just a library. And well, for instance, if asynchronous pro programming it be becomes not fancy, goes out of fashion, well, no problem. We, we, we don't have feature creep in the language. We just deprecate this library and no problem. So this is one, one of the examples why, why macros uh, sort of seamlessly uh, feel seamless in Scala. So another example is, uh, is one of the promised interactions with other language features. So string interpolations and, and uh, strings in general so strings are perceived as something bad and untyped. You know, there's this, this expression, stringly typed programming, you know. But actually with macros, they don't have to be. They don't have to be like that. So, so here we have this f string interpolator uh, that, uh, that essentially implements printf in a statically typed manner. So at compile time, if you, if you misspecify the modifiers or if you splice some type incorrect things, you, you, will, you will get a compile time error. And that all thanks to macros. And here's how it works. So actually, as I said, a lot of features in Scala get desugared into method calls, and string interpolation is no exception. So when, when the compiler sees this f uh, quotes something, it desugars it into, into a call to an extension method called f on string context. So here we have this implicit class, blah, blah. You can, you can gloss over that. I mean, th this is just a way of, of in Scala to declare extension methods. So, and uh, the, main point, the main point here, that f, f can be a normal method, and then everything will be processed at, at, at runtime. But f can also be a macro that inserts type ascriptions in strategic places. And then this type of ascriptions will make compiler, uh, yeah, will make compiler emit errors. If you, if you get the types wrong. And the next example is, uh, is, is another way how to, how to make this feature play nicely. So remember quasi calls, and remember this, this tension that we had that we couldn't put them into, into the language, and, that, and thus we had to come up with reify. Well, reify doesn't, uh, didn't work quite well. It, uh, it requires its arguments to be statically typed, that is, if I want to write some, some code template that I later want to use in a macro, with Rayify, I must have this template uh, type check. So it cannot contain free variables, for instance. And therefore, if I have a huge template and then I want to factor it out into this, this, and this function, I cannot do that with Rayify. Because when I, factor te uh, when I cut templates, th these parts, they might not make sense uh, in, in isolation without other parts. So back to quasi codes. Quasi codes solve this, this problem because they don't care about types. And this, this has proven to be quite useful in, uh, in well, macro development. Uh, but now again, string interpolation. With string interpolation, you can embed arbitrary languages into Scala. And then you can, and with macros, you can process them at compile time. So, well, sure, you can just embed Scala into Scala because I really like Scala. And yeah, this is how it worked. So, so this, this, uh, this is one of the examples of uh, how minimalism of uh, Scala's macro system actually paid off and actually brought some, something really interesting and unexpected. Now, 
I'll, I, I have one more example, and I don't know how to approach it because that's my favorite feature of Scala, really. People, oh my god. So, implicits. Uh, maybe you've heard of it, maybe not. I'll just give a, a quick, quick introduction to implicits. So say we are building a serialization library. And this serialization library, it will be based on this function called pickle uh, that takes this, uh, takes this argument that it wants to serialize. And then we want, we want to make this function extensible. So therefore, we, we use type classes to, to pull the, the moving parts away from the function so that user can configure all this stuff. And so we create this pickler type class that has the pickle method, and then, and then user can, uh, can implement this pickling strategies. So for example, we know how to pickle an int. Most likely we'll just take this binary array and then write an integer into it. Or if it's not a binary array, if it's JSON, we can do some other strategy. And well, here you can see how, how, how this extensibility works. So user has almost complete control over, over what can be what can be serialized and how. And then, thanks to implicits, we actually don't have to, we actually don't have to provide this implicit parameter. Uh, Scala compiler is going to figure it out for, for, uh, for, for ourselves. So if, if we declare a pickler for int with this implicit keyword, then Scala is going to think, oh, okay, I need, I need, I need a pickler of integer, and here it is, marked as implicit, cool. I, I, just, I just put it into that call. And uh, if we try to pickle something unsupported, then, then we get a, a static error. So Scala will say, oh my god, I, I, I don't know how to pickle a string. And that's, well, that's quite cool. That gives you some sense of security, and that's what uh, being statically typed is about. So speaking of this implicits and uh, how it works with serialization, the bad thing about implicits and type classes in general is that you actually have to implement them, right? So for instance, if you have, uh, have some data type, well, then you, for, for instance, this person, then you have to, to say, okay, I serialize this field and that field, and I put this into a pickle, and all, all that's fine, and, uh, unless you have 100 of these persons in your program. That's, that's definitely not, not cool. So here's how macros can help, and here's how they improve upon state of the art, and there are libraries already in the wild that do this. So see all, all this boilerplate that, that you have to write yourself, you can generate it with a macro. So, and it will, it will be completely equivalent to this code. So this code and that code, well, they're going to be the same. So there are ways to, 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 to fight with boilerplates uh, using some advanced type level techniques. And that's fine, but uh, some of these ways, they, they have performance problems. But macros, they don't have this problem because the code that ends up in bytecode, it's exactly the same as if you've written it yourself. So it's going to have excellent performance. So hey, macros are quite cool, right? But <laughs> it, it's, 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 not, it's, it's not it yet. So the, the coolest thing about macros is, again, interaction with other language features and how they map onto these method calls. So apparently, as you can see, you can declare, well, here you can only see vals, implicit vals, but you can, you can declare methods as implicits. So you can say implicit def equals something. And if you declare such a macro, uh, such a method as a macro, then you don't have to write this code at all. So instead of writing this, this line 100 times for all, all the classes in your program, you just write this implementation once and, and forget about serialization forever. You, you don't care anymore. So how, how it works, just, just a brief walkthrough for, for those of you who, who don't know how um, implicits in Scala work. So as we've seen before, compi when compiler needs uh, to, to, to resolve some, some implicit parameter in a call to a function, it, it goes through, through the lexical scope and it sees what's declared there with, with the implicit flag and then it tries to match it with, with the expected type and stuff. But actually it's a bit more complicated because implicit scope, it transcends lexical scope. And for one, it's, uh, uh, the compiler also looks into some special places. Say, as for instance, this companion object of, of, of the pickler type class. And when we, put, uh, when we put this macro into the companion object, then uh, the user of, of our macro, he or she won't have to import anything at all. So it will just work, and no, will, no one will notice anything, just, just like this. So you write a normal invocation of a pickle function, and then compiler finds this implicit, it's a macro, it clicks, it expands, and as you see here, 
everything happens without without any user involvement. Uh, so th this topic is is much more elaborated than than I presented here in such a f funny style. And uh, you can Google my talk, uh, Applied Materialization in Scala, for, for more details. It's, uh, it, it's a bit more deep. Uh, you, you can also materialize uh, functional dependencies, and you can also do other cool stuff. You can also connect to, to type-level techniques. Well, th this is quite interesting, so. And, uh, okay, what we have here? All right. So this implicits, as I mentioned before, implicits are my favorite feature of Scala uh, because they, they sort of connect uh, the realm of types and the realm of terms. So j just by specifying a type, you can ask the compiler to, to provide you a value of the type. And this is where this connection goes. And wh when you multiply that by, by some restricted form of dependent typing that Scala supports, things become very interesting. And, uh, well, as I mentioned before, uh, this year talks about Scala, are they powered by macros to this or that extent? And you might want to, to attend them and, and see how, how macros help in this or that case. <laughs> so th this is just a fun quote. It was quite, quite cute to, to, to go through, through my older presentations. And, and th this is a quote from, from an early design sketch when I was having fun thinking of macro depths, macro types, macro packages, and things. But implicit, no, implicit, implicit macros, that would be really too much. And th 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 this is a good illustration of how, how macros, uh, how, how many surprises macros really brought into, in, into development of Scala. And how powerful this small idea of, of just of, of just macros that expand method calls, how powerful it ended up being, thanks to Scala being so rich and interesting. Uh, well, that's, uh, that's probably it uh, for the examples of why macros worked. And ju just to recap, macros are cool because, uh, because they really use people's intuition about existing Scala features. And macro users, they don't even, they don't even have to realize that they're using macros. They, they, they just use normal features and uh, these features get transformed, they, they, get, they become better thanks to macros. And uh, because, because of this uh, design, design thing with Scala, that a lot of uh, language features actually map onto, onto method calls, we get something really interesting here. Now let's take a look into the future, into the stuff that's, uh, that's, that I'm experimenting with. So after, after the after def macros were included in the Scala to ten, and after we had this code freeze and stuff, of course uh, I, I realized that macros are missing some features. So, for instance, w with macros you cannot generate new members in public classes. Something that well, least programmers would take for granted. Well, sure you don't have classes, but but you can do this stuff. Essentially, essentially the same stuff. And so, what's what's the problem with macros, with def macros in to ten? Well, the problem is that they cannot affect bindings. In, in, in almost any capacity. So the first aspect of this problem is that you cannot pass just random stuff into macros. It won't work because macros want to type check their arguments before the expansion takes place. So this, this, is, the, this is the question that I get from, from all these folks. Oh, okay, can you implement Lambda with your macros? Oh, no, you can't. Oh, but in Lisp, in Lisp you can, so yeah. And yeah, that's right. In 2.10, that's impossible. The, the, the second thing, the, the, same, uh, the second manifestation of the problem is, is that we, we cannot generate new classes and put them into some visible places. So since macros are type checked as expressions, all definitions, they stay local. So I can generate every, uh, all the things that I want, but they will stay local to, to this block and no one will be able to see them. Well, actually, actually that's not true, but that's, that's a topic for another talk. <laughs> so, as I mentioned, after, after 2.10 ship has sailed, I, I set out to, to fix this injustice to bring us to the same level as Lisp. And then I established this, this macro paradise, a, a GitHub repo where I experiment with random stuff and that everyone can use. So f first it was a Scala fork, now it's a compiler plugin. So actually in, in Scala 2.10 you can, you can use this compiler plugin and, well, you can, you can use all these fancy new developments in your production projects. J just a single compiler plugin and you're all set. So, well, 
And then, and then the, there were these three macro flavors that they wanted to implement. Untyped macros, typed macros, macro annotations. So let's, let's see what, what that implies. So untyped macros, they solve this, this lambda problem. So now, now I can finally say, okay, these folks in Scala macros are rich enough to do that. No problem. So essentially, in, instead, of, uh, instead of type specification in, in the signature of a macro, you just, uh, you, you just write an underscore, and, and well, that's it. And then macros won't, won't bother you with type checking. The second feature is type macros. So def macros, they expand terms, macro calls, but it, it also would be fun to expand types. So here we, we extend some, some class, or so we think, but actually it's, it's a type macro. So this type macro, it can generate some, some publicly visible synthetic class, and then you can inherit from it, and then you get all the members in that synthetic class. Okay, that solves the problem of type providers, for instance. High F sharp. Also, we have macro notations. So def macros expand terms, type macros expand types, and macro notations, they expand definitions. So you put a, just, just a simple annotation on your definition, and then it gets expanded. And uh, since, uh, since Scala actually has first class modules, you can use that to, to implement uh, type providers as well. Well, again, I, I, type providers are more than just, uh, uh, just generating some boilerplate. Type providers also support this erased type generation, and this is, this is quite interesting and cool. This can be emulated by, by Scala macros as well, to some extent, but I, I won't go into details, they're quite hairy. So, so we see this, these new macro flavors that fix all the problems that def macros have. So what's, what, what next? Actually, we have, we have this metaphor that if you, if you have, uh, if you can, can hide behavior of the macro behind uh, its, its type signature, so if you can say that a macro is essentially equivalent to a method with, with the signature, then it's a black box macro, because its implementation it can be treated as a black box. But if you cannot do that, so for instance, in the case of macro notations, you cannot write a signature in Scala's type system for that, then it's a white box macro. So macros in 210, they're a black box? Well, to some extent. And uh, all these new things, they're white box. So white box macros, how cool are they? Do people like them? Well, actually, Actually, no, not really. So sure, boilerplate generation will, in type provider fashion, it's, it's cool, and a lot of people want it, but, but the rest, not much. All, all that stuff that I'm talking about, it, it was implemented around half a year ago, maybe more, and by now, I, I don't know of a lot of really nice use cases for that. And ironically enough, all the uses for untyped macros, they were actually driven by the the, by the desire to, to, to extend Scala's type system. So if Scala type system was powerful enough, for example, if it had kind polymorphism, people wouldn't even need this, this untyped macros in that particular use case. So this is fun, and, and why, why, it have, why it is like that? So our hypothesis is that in, in Scala, people are really used to, to working with types and thinking with types, and it's considered to be a super awesome form of hackery to, to come up with some type level solution. That's on, on one hand. And on the other hand, well, you, you don't, in Scala you don't, have, you don't have a lot of language features uh, that work on definition level. So sure, you can write definitions, but you, there, there's not, not many ways of abstracting over definitions. So there's, there are no synergies to exploit, uh, uh, unlike it was in the case of def macros. So that's one, of, one explanation that they have. And another one is that, well, when, when you write white box macros, actually you, you, you might end up in a situation when you produce some code that's not Scala anymore. I mean, that, that doesn't feel like Scala. So as I'm running out of time, so how, how, how much time do I have? Uh, okay, so, so just uh, almost five minutes. So let's just quickly see uh, this example and how it works. So say we have, uh, we have a need to represent enumerations in our Scala code. So we need to generate all this boilerplate, right, for, 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 for days of week and uh, 
So we, we need to have some singletons that represent these days of week, uh, and then the singletons, they actually have to be instances of some class, and this, and this class has to override two strings so that, so that we get pretty printing and oh, all this good stuff, right? Of course, we don't want to, to write this by hand. And therefore, let's, let's just take one of the tools that, that we've seen, one of the white boss macros, macro annotations, and let's just implement it like that. So we put this macro annotation onto some nice object that, that represents this enumeration values in, in some form of a DSL. And then this, the, this macro annotation, it will take the guts of this object. So, so uh, th this expressions that, that you can write freely inside an object, they, they get lifted into a constructor. And then it will, it will see, see into the, that constructor. It will figure out all these names that we provided, and then it will generate all the boilerplate that we want. Everything cool and everything so concise and nice until, until uh, you scrutinize this a bit more closely. So first of all, it doesn't feel like Scala. You just write some stuff. It has Hanin identifiers, whatever that means, some, just some identifiers. And then they're, they're not even declared anywhere. So for instance, if you declare a method called Monday outside, is this Monday going to correspond to that Monday or whatever that would mean? So this is, this is what I meant when I, when I said that white box macros might be too powerful because they can distort Scala code in, into ways that, that don't map on people in, people's intuition about how Scala code should work. And here's, when, when people on the mailing list started discussing this, that stuff, quite quickly uh, another, another proposal has arisen. So here you just try, you just write these values. You, you, you don't provide this boilerplate, but you, but you say that these are no, normal values. And for, for everyone who reads this code, it should be quite natural that th th this, uh, what's, uh, what will be generated by a macro after all, uh, after, uh, after macro expansion finishes. So this is, this is the tension uh, between uh, the power of macros and uh, the spirit of Scala. And this is something that, that we're currently exploring in Macro Paradise. And uh, this is how we try to, to combine both, uh, both the tradition of Scala and tradition of Lisp into ultimate macros. So just, uh, just to summarize what, we've, what, what I talked about. So first, macros started as, as a fun project. But then, really industrial drive for metaprogramming, it, it put it into a Scala release. It happened so fast, and it, it, it felt really great. Macros are cool, let's do more, more macros and more languages. And uh, then macros worked out really well uh, because of this, because, of, because they feel just, just a part of Scala, just like a part of Scala. And because a lot of features in Scala, they actually map onto, onto those macros. And this brings a lot of interesting interactions. So when I, put, when I put these slides online, you can take a look at, at the paper and at the talk that, that I referred to. You can see much more examples of how macros interact with other language features. And then while we, while we were trying to, to figure out what works and what does not, we came, we came up with this concept of black box and white box macros. And now we're trying to, to marry this with Scala so that it can get the best macros possible. Thanks for your attention.